if anyone, do you think one thing from this podcast is that this idea that a picture on the wall of the Art Institute or the Met of the Louvre, you know, didn't get there handed down like a tablet to Moses. You know, it got there because it's been bought and sold and changed hands and people may have changed its shape and size and had different ideas about its quality and its framing, how frequently it was cleaned. It may have been hung opposite a window. It may not have been. You know, they all have a history that affects a countless chain of people deciding things about them, about what to do with it and how to present it from the minute it was painted till the way it's shown now. And all those things influence what you see. Um, you know, they're not, they're, they're decisions taken um, with varying degrees of um, sensitivity over the centuries that, that affect the way pictures look, how often they've been cleaned, what kind of ideas about retouching, how, what kind of varnish, how they're lit, how they're framed. Yeah, that's all going on around them. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 182. And this episode is with Larry Keith, who is the head of conservation and keeper of the National Gallery of London, where he preserves and conserves and presides over and maintains some of the world's most precious works of art, including paintings by... I almost called him Da Vinci, but I was taught that, no, I should in fact refer to him as Leonardo, and then Caravaggio, and Rubens. And needless to say, this is terra incognita for the show, but I'm very glad to be exploring it. And Larry and I talk about how, as a conservator, he looks at a piece of art in its history and how this informs the way that he treats it. So we discuss some of the tools and techniques of the job and how Larry has treated a number of famous paintings, such as Leonardo's Virgin of the Rocks, Caravaggio's The Boy and the Lizard, and Rubens' A View of Hetstein in the Early Morning, though we talk about a number of other paintings as well. And if you're watching on video, I should have the paintings uh, images of them between Larry and I as we're talking about them. And if you're listening on audio, there are, they're mentioned in case you want to look them up because that might be helpful. Other news, uh, this will be the third episode, I think, where uh, the Patreon is in existence. So if you are so moved, there's a Patreon with an ad-free stream, transcripts, and show notes. As always, reviews, subscriptions, these sorts of things help a lot. And now, without any further ado, I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Larry. Have you uh, read this short story by Jorge Luis Borges called uh, Pierre Menard, author of the Don Quixote. No, you haven't. Okay, so this story, it is about this character, Pierre Menard, and he is a huge fan of the Don Quixote. And he, it, do you know who who Jorge Luis Borges is, though? Or are you familiar? Yeah, so a magical realist and. Pierre Menard want he's so in love with the Don Quixote and Cervantes that he wants to rewrite it. And in doing so, he like studies everything about Cervantes and essentially like tries to live his life as Cervantes and tries to become him so that he can not just rewrite it, because obviously he could just well not type it, but handwrite it. But he wants to actually like be Cervantes and rewrite it authentically and as i was reading some of your articles that's exactly what came to mind when i was thinking about conservatorship and bringing these paintings back to life that you really have to know everything you can about these artists to accurately get in their head and not sort of superimpose your own views on their paintings well, that's the intention. Um, it depends a lot on the individual project, though, because sometimes it's essentially 
you know, a mechanical problem about removing a varnish or something. And um, the kind of more abstract interpretation you're talking about, maybe make compensating for losses or something, then you have to think a lot about style. But, you know, I guess with all of these things, you know, we're editing and our stated objective is to be, um, our stated goal is to be uh, as objective as we can be in how we interpret these things. But we are definitely interpreting and that, I think the more you do that, the more you realize that, um, and the longer I've been at it as well, you know, there is definitely a period I, and, um, you know, we're juggling a lot of things about an object that's changed, a context that's changed, a viewing situation that's changed, you know, so we're not, it's not just a time machine back to how it was, but, um, clearly you think a lot about original artist intent, even if you don't understand how you'll never achieve it again. So from that point of view, perhaps, yeah. Well, before we launch into some of the actual paintings and the work, I I just was wondering how somebody ends up becoming head of conservation and keeper of the National Gallery in London. I'm assuming it's through art history, but also I imagine that as opposed to just becoming an art historian, I mean, it's not just about a desire to learn and understand, but maybe you are an artist too, and you really want to be crafty and contribute in some way beyond just the scholarship. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, basically, I, I literally always used to joke that it was how I managed to turn art history into rent. But, um, you know, it's obviously deeper than that, because it's a strange old profession that really, unusually, I think, in the modern era, um, demands that you have some ability to synthesize information from lots of different places. So, I mean, the kind of tripod of core stuff you need to know is some pretty basic um, chemistry, not the sort of chemistry that would frighten a real scientist, but still, you, know, you have to know some some basic stuff about physics and chemistry. Um, history of art, for sure, so you understand what it is you're looking at and how you're working with it and what it was and what it might be. And then you have to have some manual skills, some craft skills, some um, you know, ability to move the brush around. There are some wonderful colleagues of mine who are great painters, but by and large, very few are, because if you think about a burning desire to make paintings um, and how what we do at its best is doesn't draw attention to itself, you know, there's something core, which is very different, but we certainly have to understand the craft of the things we work on and be able to reproduce it or mimic it as required. Um, but I think the challenge, I mean, I, I, my colleagues have come from uh, first degrees usually in one of those three areas, studio art, art history, or sciences. But you definitely need to know a bit about the three. And um, I think that's the, the exciting part about it is that uh, the problem solving can vary um, on from one treatment to another about which kind of areas it draws more heavily upon. Um, and so, you know, it's the synthesizing or the kind of combining things and I guess, to me, there was something deeply satisfying in all this kind of, you know, head work going on. But the answer ultimately is expressed through your fingers, you know, in the language of craft, I would say, more than art, but in the language of craft, for sure. Uh, and um, I think people who kind of come into our profession find that a pleasing mix, however they got there. <laughs> Does the chemistry come in with regard to, on the one hand, I mean, analyzing the varnishes, for instance, that have been used in the past, but also as you're applying new varnishes and making changes to the paintings, ensuring that the compounds that you're using... I'm very privileged changing. to work in a museum that has a you know world-leading scientific conservation scientific department, so... I don't get involved in any analysis. I think a lot of what we do, uh, even our science, you know, conservatives are informed consumers of conservation science rather than scientists. But it's understanding core principles about how solvents work so that um, without necessarily knowing um, exactly what a given varnish is, because that's not really part realistic to many people working outside of, you know, major museums. But still, you, through... Um, educated guesswork and understanding solvents, you, you might want to know how 
how you might dissolve one thing and not another, and what properties of your solvents might be best for the particular task. So that's a bit of chemistry when you're talking about the physics, it's understanding the degradation and, and how things break down and what the problems are there, how things should be displayed. You need to understand a bit about, you know, environmental um, factors when you're thinking about what to do with the panel painting. So it's all kinds of different things, little, little niche areas of expertise are drawn upon. But um, yeah, certainly when you make choices about what varnish to use, that can be based on all kinds of things, not just how they look. What's their, what are their properties? What's the molecule? How, how does the polymer work? How reversible might it be? Um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, and, and some of what we do is this pure craft tradition and understood in that way, but it's a, occasionally you need to make a, an informed decision. And that's where I think the scientific background is helpful. Even if it's knowing who to ask to get the, the answer that you can't come up with and knowing what the questions are already requires some, some knowledge. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that this first painting that I wanted to discuss will help us put a lot of these these issues or make them more concrete. And this is actually a, a first for the show, but I'm going to attempt to employ some editing skills that I don't really have and put images of the paintings on the screen. Uh, but for our audio only listeners, can well, first you might want to pull it up, but can you describe the scene in Da Vinci's Virgin of the Rocks? Though, I mean, I, of course, encourage them to Google it quickly if they can. Yes. Um, I'm going to be super snobby and say that you have to call it Leonardo's painting, not Da Vinci. That's a modern construct. He didn't really have a surname. So, fun fact. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you want to wind up in Italian, you can talk about Da Vinci's paintings because they'll just, they, 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 they don't, you'll get a response, let's put it that way. So here we have, I mean, it's a very, very complicated iconography. People still not quite sure what's going on. It's an imagined scene. It's kind of a apocryphal thing. It's not particularly um, explicitly described in, in, in the Bible. Um, but here we have an imagined meeting between the Baptist and, and Christ. Obviously, they, he recognizes, the Baptist recognizes Christ's divinity. There's an angel. It's it's possibly, I mean, one, I don't know, one of the ideas is that it's an imagined idea of the meeting on the flight into Egypt. But it, it really is not, it's a kind of reverie about an imagined thing. It's meant to be a departure point, almost a meditative thing. Um, it's one of the most long and torturous um stories in Leonardo's life that this commission started uh, from memory in 1483 and he didn't finish it. Well, he didn't finish it full stop, but um, he finally got paid in something like 157. And there were two versions of the painting, ours, one in the Louvre, very complicated stopping, starting, working on other things, the change of government, going to Rome, going to Florence, coming back, um, going to court because he wasn't paid enough, going to court because it wasn't finished enough, etc., etc. It's a very, very complex picture. But it has some, and there's lots of discussion about how do you compare the two versions, the one in the Louvre and ours, which was first, which was later. Um, there's so much going on in this painting, it's hard to even know where to start. But understanding something of that is very key to... Um, our work on the painting. And I guess what I would say about this as a conservator in a, in a major museum like this is, you know, of course, one of the drivers for cleaning paintings, that is removing old discolored varnishes and retouchings is, you know, they look better when you renew them and uh, replace them. And, and, and now we do them with materials that are um, quite permanent. Uh, and, and we show them in, in conditions where they're not going to yellow and discolor anything like as rapidly and all that stuff is going on. Um, and in many cases, that's enough. But in this case, um, I think the cultural weight of working on anything by Leonardo was such that it's not done casually. And, and when he went to Milan, he had a huge, well, he quickly put together a rather big studio and um, there are lots of artists working for him, uh, working with him, working for him, of varying degrees of skill. And, um, a lot of what he did was collaborative. Uh, and that's very normal for the Renaissance anyway, but it's really clear in Milan because 
suddenly he's during the Last Supper he's painting a fresco in the Palazzo um, the Castello Sforzesca. He's making the big bronze horse. He's you know, doing court entertainments. He's doing portraits. All this stuff's going on. So um, this painting falls in all that mix, and that's part of why it took so long to finish. And there's no doubt a degree of recycling of drawings and collaboration and delegation um, within the studio. And that's one of the things you try and unpick as part of understanding the picture as we clean it. And so in the National Gallery, we have 20 odd paintings from the Leonardo studio or from his collaborators in Milan. Some of them are magnificent paintings, some of them not so much. But we spent about 10 years um, cleaning, restoring, studying um, about 10 or 15 of these pictures before we even thought about cleaning the Leonardo uh, to understand about how the layer structures worked, what kind of materials were used, how um, things might change, what changes, what doesn't change, what are the aesthetic issues in removing varnishes, what are you left with with drying grass, all those things form the background to doing that work. Um, so I guess that's one thing to set the stage of, of how this came about. Um, in terms of cleaning the picture, well, I think the exciting thing here was to try and understand what its qualities were, particularly against the other picture. Um, in many ways, it's less highly finished than the one in Paris. It's uh, more broadly painted, but it has a kind of ambition about um, an intellectual ambition that's very striking. Um, this is where the, the collaboration, much of what we do is in a museum for sure, is in close collaboration with um, a curatorial scholarship and scientific learning. But for example, when you know that about the time he's working on this picture is the same time in his notebooks he's trying to understand how vision works. He's one of the first people who really understood that when the light levels go down, you don't see color as strongly. You know, we know now about rods and cones in the eye, but before this thing, you know, a, a red drapery would be dark red in the shadows and the blue drapery would be dark blue in the shadows. But if you look at the art painting, you'll see that all the um, the local colors, as they go darker, they lose um, color intensity and they merge toward a kind of brownie black, which is a really modern idea and it's based on his, his research and it's kind of baked into the painting technique he developed for how he built this picture up. So all that stuff's going on, um, which is one of the really striking things about the painting, make it very, very exciting to understand that as a kind of eureka moment when you see, you know, what the ambitions were. Um, I feel like I'm rambling a bit now. <laughs> Does that make sense when you look at it? Because you see, it really is not very brightly colored work. And if you think about a Botticelli or something like that, little even a generation before, you have much stronger local colors, you know, red, blue, um, yellow, balanced against one another. Here it's quite muted, and the whole thing is built over a kind of brownie matrix with color added very judiciously. No, that, that, that is so cool. I mean, when you said earlier, you said everything done by Leonardo, and I refer to him as Leonardo instead of Da Vinci, it's not done casually. I was wondering whether that meant you're making the assumption that when working with a master like this, every detail of the painting is purposeful, so everything can be analyzed and interpreted as having some intended significance. No, but no, this is no, just... I don't, that, that's kind of, that, that rapidly goes to, to, you know, tinfoil hat territory. No, what I meant to say was just the cultural weight of Leonardo is that as a modern museum with a Leonardo painting, you don't just look at it and think, oh, that looks a bit yellow, that would be nice to clean. No, you have to think about why you're doing it and really um, have your research together. Because I would say that in a, in a major museum like ours and many others in the world, you know, the conservation treatment is an opportunity for a kind of reevaluation of the painting, and it's a it becomes like the hub of all kinds of integrated research, whether it's its provenance, how it got to the museum, how it was painted, what the painting materials are, all those things. So that's what I meant is that it's a it's not just one you pluck off the wall because it's looking a bit yellow and it'd be nice to do. Be, I see. Yeah, I see. But I mean, still when when you take into account the fact that 
he was a master and he was a scientist and all of these things were going on, you can look at the color scheme of the painting and not just shrug it off as a whim, but take it as, I mean, maybe living isn't the, isn't the right word, but it's an intellectual document in a sense of sure. the I mean, evolution. We, we have a lot of things we bring when we look at old master paintings that we have a kind of deep and rather mis, you know, uh, idea of painters as, you know, 19th century, you know, capital or small R romantic creators. And, you know, a lot of them were not you know, in that same way. They weren't up in the, in the, in the attic with their beret, um, burning furniture to stay warm while they express their souls. Even someone like Van Gogh, you know, his box of yarns where he'd pull out threads of yarn and think about color relationships and understand, you know, the, in, in accord with modern color theory and plan the palette of a painting that, you know, we'd look at a Van Gogh and think, oh, it's so expressionistic. It's so such a tormented soul. And, and he's sort of like going for it. And he's actually not. I mean, he is all those things, but it's also this learning and consideration and things going on um, that inform what looks very spontaneous and isn't. And I think that that's, that's kind of the business of business of painting as well in the Renaissance. I mean, the thing about, you know, you look at the version of the rocks and think it is amazing, but it, it is, of course. But how many people look at that and think, oh, yes, he used the same drawing and traced it, you know, twice. That, you know, basically made a copy of the drawing and he modified it because he's Leonardo. They're not, they're not photocopies of one another, but he's recycling compositional ideas. There's a, there's a pragmatic part of it as well that you need to unpick as understanding, you know, what's going on. Why do you say that he modified it because he's Leonardo? Well, because he is the kind of restless um, thinker. And he is, a, you know, he, his whole career is about, you know, that saying about don't let perfect be enemy of good. Um, he never, really, dad, he never that. really learned that. <laughs> and so his, um, you know, his whole artistic career is a steady stream of annoyed clients, works abandoned, not quite finished, um, for polit political reasons or because he went somewhere else or because he got a better offer or because he strung someone along. Um, you know, uh, the St. Jerome in the Vatican, not finished. The Adoration of the Magi in the Uffizi, not finished. The Virgin of the Rocks in London, not quite finished. Um, the Battle of Angiari in the Palazzo Publico, not finished, abandoned, covered over, you know. The bronze horse, not finished, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the Mona Lisa never delivered to his client because he couldn't quite stop tinkering with it, you know, with him when he died. Hmm. If only we could do uh, that this, in our own lives. This is already right? amazing. Hmm? Uh -huh. I said this is already so amazing. I'm learning. I'm learning so much. But uh, well, the reason that I, I picked this painting to start with of all the ones that you've worked on was my understanding is that it was largely an aesthetic restoration. And maybe we can depart just from this picture for the moment, but you already referenced the proverbial painting that has yellowed on the wall that you might pick off to, to uh, but what are the typical culture culprits that over in hundreds of years result in the need for restoration? What sorts of things happen around the painting and the okay well i'm talking the... about you know within a narrow band of what we you know loosely call old master paintings so paintings in the tradition from the renaissance through well and even still today but certainly early 20th century where um an easel painting so i mean by that i'm not fresco not works on paper so that i work that's how our profession sort of breaks down um and so most of those pictures, with ex some exceptions, um, but most of them are conceived uh, as being painted in either oil or egg-based uh, media on canvas or wood, um, and they are what they are. And then uh, at some stage, uh, they're given a varnish coating, which helps saturate the colors and uh, provides a layer of protection. And those varnishes over the centuries have evolved a lot in what they're made out of. Uh, but they're the thing that typically um, degrades. 
and oxidizes. And the, the main culprit there is the ultraviolet part of the light um, that you see. And they gather dirt and atmospheric pollution, etc. So those varnishes break down and become yellow, orange. You know, they, they become warmer, darker. They also develop a fine kind of crackler, so they're like um, the equivalent of looking through a broken windscreen or a, or a net curtain. You know, they, they kind of become a bit hazy, so colors all shift to the yellow. Uh, light tones become darker. Dark tones become lighter because they've got this kind of hazy film over them. And that tends to, you know, obscure artistic intent in terms of what the painters were trying to do. That's one of the things that we're dealing with is... Um, so um, renewing those varnishes, removing them and renewing them. Um, the other thing is that pictures have a life and they go through changes and damages and changes of taste. And, um, and historically, um, when pictures were damaged, you know, they, their, their pictures were, were restored as long as they were being made. Um, up until fairly recently, the last century or so, most people who repaired paintings were painters. And uh, generally, if there were losses to be done, um, there's different approaches about what they would do. They would do these things called retouchings, which is what we do. Um, but there was, I think there wasn't a kind of professional understanding of the job. Um, they were very free to, when we, in general, we restrict our retouching to compensating for damages and being very light touch. Uh, but I think there was no, um, in many times over the last few centuries, there was no problem with an artist improving pictures and deciding that this would be better or repainting areas or editing in a way that's much more interventive. And furthermore, they did that generally with the paint that was very similar to the painting used, paint used by the artist. Um, now, oil paint typically gets quite a bit darker in the first century that it lives and then that kind of curve flattens out a bit so let's just say in 1850 you're a, you're an artist and you've been asked to restore a renaissance painting and you do some you reinterpret a drapery or decide that this guy would look better with red hair than brown hair or whatever you do your work or maybe you're very careful and only do careful beautifully matched retouchings and the losses but your lovely fresh oil paint that matches when you've applied it um, will darken while the original paint has stopped darkening and your oil paint chemically will get harder and harder and harder and more difficult to remove. So we spend a lot of our time effectively unzipping old um, restorations and, um, and dealing with the consequences of that. And uh, it's not like I'm going to say everything we do now is amazing and perfect, but I think there are some analogies about the progress of technology if you think about I don't know, medicine or something like that. We are able to do things now that are more stable and more reversible. And we certainly have, uh, we're much more um, circumspect about the interpretive aspect. Hmm. Well, returning to the London version of the rocks as opposed to the, the Louvre version, you mentioned that the varnishes shift and color shift and Obviously, that's going to be particularly important for a painting like this when the colors aren't arbitrary, but meant to reflect an improved understanding of vision. But my understanding is that the problem or the main reason that this painting needed a touch up was from a varnish in that was put on there in 1928. Uh, 40, 48. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 48. Okay. Mm -hmm. I yeah. wrong key <laughs> when I when I wrote that down. So Maybe I should ask one, I mean, just what what chemically constitutes a varnish before we talk about, I mean, how you get it off and what sort of goes into the calculus of deciding what to put on to... Well, the varnish is a, is a transparent film. It's a resin. Uh, it's an, an, until very recently, it's a natural resin from various things. Sometimes... Older varnishes are combinations of of um, resinous substances from plants, or like damar, or um, and and they also mixed oil with them to make a very lustrous, transparent coating. That but those tend to get very hard in, in discolor. Um, I mean, we still use natural resin varnishes sometimes now, and now we have some synthetic ones as well. 
Um, but they were always, I mean, certainly from the Baroque period, and, and actually we've got examples, some examples of Renaissance varnishes, very old varnishes that are still intact, but they've always been seen as that layer that comes off when they, um, in most cases, not every case. Uh, in fact, I can talk about details later. I mean, exceptions. Um, some artists, you'd have to say the varnish is integral to the, what the painting is, and you can't really disturb it. But for others, not so much. Um, so yeah, that varnish is meant to be um, a translucent, glossy, well, transparent, fairly glossy, uh, saturating layer that adds luster to the colors, that adds some um, depth to the darker tones and provides physical protection. Mm. And you, so you just mentioned that there are synthetics and novel varnishes, but I'm wondering if hmm, when you're touching up a painting, do you feel committed for purposes of authenticity to using the same oil or egg based Absolutely paint? Not. That no, no, that's the whole point. That was what people did before. And as I explained them, um, if I were to use oil paint today, my retouchings would be, be darker than the thing they were matched. Okay, um, that's what I was thinking. So, no, no, we we um, we need to understand the painting technique and, and replicate it very faithfully, but in as much as we can do it in stable, uh, reversible equivalents. And the basic idea of any old master painting, if you think about how it's put together, it's about what's on top and what's below and what's transparent and what's opaque and how those things are manipulated. And so um, we definitely mimic layer structures. I mean, the, the, the easiest thing to say is that everybody knows if you mix, you know, blue and yellow, you get green. Yeah, easy. Um, but you can also get green by putting transparent yellow over an opaque blue. It looks different, but it's green, and you have to know which way that green was made if you're retouching a picture. And you can't mix two colors if they are on the picture you're matching are done by superimposing colors. And if that whole thing is influenced by an underlayer that's quite red, for example, then you know, we'll copy all that. And so we may not use exactly the same pigments, but we certainly manipulate um, the transparencies and opacities and layer structures very, very faithfully. So in that point of view, yeah, we are very authentic, but we will do it with synthetic or reversible materials. We'll do it on top of the varnish that we apply. So I could spend years retouching a picture and anyone could wash it off in 15 minutes with a very mild, you know, completely risk-free solvent. If that's how it's supposed to be, it's meant to be something that's not set in stone. Hmm. This idea of what's on top and, and what's below, I think we'll talk more about the layer structure when we get to Caravaggio, but most people, or maybe just me, tend to think of paintings as flat, uh, two-dimensional objects. Of course, there are these absolutely beautiful, almost geological images in your articles of these, I don't know what you'd want to call them. Cross sections, uh, cross, yeah, of all the layers, yeah. 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 Cross sections of the paintings, but where where the paint forms these like sedimentary layers, like something you might see at the, at the Grand Canyon or exactly. in a geo. Yeah, that's just it, because I think, again, it goes back to this idea that, you know, we have, we think about, you know, 20th century artists, you know, kind of emoting on the canvas and, and mixing all the colors and going in one go um, and not thinking about building up things. And, and that that's just not how it was. That's just, you know, the craft of it was very different. Mm -hmm. Where I was going to go with this, though, is how do you use non-invasive methods like infrared imaging or x-rays to get a sense of the condition of a painting before you start uh, touching it up and working with it? Well, they often um, will show you things that um, you can't see so easily with the naked eye. I mean, x-radiography will tell you about, I mean, it's more than just telling you where the holes are, although they're very good at doing that because the, you know, where the damages are, where the, where the losses are, an x-ray will show you those things, or an, an infrared might show you, um, because the way it reflects in, in the infrared, you can see um, some paint that might look very similar is actually applied later in a different way, and it'll show blotchy. 
Um, they do all those things, which is great um, to really assess on a nuts and bolts way the condition, but they also are very useful tools to help to understand how something was made. Um, you know, an X-ray looks at the total atomic weight, the density of all the paint throughout all the layers. It doesn't distinguish between layers. It adds them all up and adds. So, and certain, luckily enough, um, some of the more important lighter colors are atomically really heavy. So like lead white paint, which is used ubiquitously is very heavy. And so in the next ray, it reads as white. So I just, for example, simple thing, you've got a, a head and shoulders portrait of somebody with a blue sky in the background. The blue sky, because it's mostly white, will show very, very white on the X-ray. Does that blue sky, will that blue, that big white layer, does that go behind the head or does it go around the head? Uh, and if it goes around the head, then that tells you, oh, the head was drawn in, perhaps worked up to a certain level. The, the sky was painted around it. Um, then maybe some of the hair was pulled back over the sky. You know, it's that sort of thing. Where you see a great white band across the top half of the picture and you can barely see the face and you know. Um, that the sky was blocked in and it's tidy head added later. I mean, that's a pretty mundane question to ask, but it's that sort of thing you can look at and it can start to tell you how much of a composition, if you've got very complicated overlaps and you don't see that so much in the x-ray that tells you that, well, there's a lot of planning, a lot of drawing, maybe on another piece of paper, maybe this, you know, the whole thing was transferred in some way, wasn't improvised, those kinds of things. You can see changes, you can see, if you've got two versions of the same picture and one of them, that arm that looks exactly the same in x-ray shows that it was in a different place first, then that tells you something about their relationship between the two. So those are the kinds of things we use those images for, and there are all kinds of classes of images. Um, we can effectively do x-rays for individual pigments now, um, and then it gets very complex and difficult to describe, but I mean, we use those images both Sometimes we look at them to address specific conservation questions, but often it's just to help us understand how a picture was painted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in this painting in particular, did the infrared image, infrared imaging that X-rays did anything tell? Did this teach you anything about how the painting was done that you just hadn't anticipated? The Virgin of the Rocks, you mean now? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, that was it was a one of the more impressive kind of eureka moments in my career in that we found evidence of a completely different composition underneath ours, ours which now looks ostensibly very, very similar to the one in Paris, but there is a wholly different composition beneath, and that composition relates to lots of drawings, even tiny drawings that were made at a certain point um, and the composition was taken quite far and modified at different times and abandoned. But this work underneath that panel places it at a certain place in time, makes it clear that it was done in Milan and it was, you know, done in this particular decade, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, there's lots of, and even in, in, in the 10 or 15 years since that discovery was made and the conclusions I drew as the technology has moved along, we were able to see even more of two or three different kinds of compositions below what you see now, which have slightly changed our understanding of the relationship between the two paintings. So yeah, lots of things like that, which were really kind of pivotal, um, that it was much more complex how the two pictures evolved side by side than we had thought. Hmm. And this goes also back to uh, Leonardo's restlessness that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I mean, some some painters, if there are two versions of the same one, there's one that might be a bit more perfunctory than the other, but they look pretty much the same. Um, but with him, you know, you, there's like three compositions underneath ours. <laughs> so it's very complex. Um, and uh, we're still kind of unpicking all the implications of that. Yeah. Okay. One dimension of this painting in particular that I was curious about, I don't think it was mentioned in the articles I read is the mountains. And when I look at these mountains or these rocks behind the Virgin, they immediately remind me of something that you might see in a, a Bosch painting or even like a much more modern. And they seem like nothing that Leonardo would ever see in Italy. 
that's just not what the mountains look like. Well, you know, there you can go down all sorts of rabbit holes about that. But there are people who have identified areas in northern Tuscany that look a bit like that. But yeah, it's art. It's fantastical. But he's certainly, whether or not there are portraits of individual landscapes, which is seriously unlikely, um, they nonetheless reflect interest in geological formations and uh, how, how these things were formed. You did say, though, that this is something of a reverie. And in dreams, if this is some something of a, a dreamlike state, things tend to get exaggerated. And these are some very extreme, extreme he's, mountains. He's quite interested in those things throughout most of his career. If you look at the Virgin and Child that set out on the Louvre, or the other Virgin of the Rocks, the Yard and Wide Hips, you know, it's, it's definitely a thing that uh, interested him. Well, there are, there are two last things about this painting that I wanted to touch on before we moved on. And one of them is I'd, I'd never thought much about frames in museums before thinking about this painting. As I walk, I mean, the museum that I've spent the most time in by far is the Art Institute. And I just walk through the Art of Chicago, sorry, the Art Institute of Chicago. And I, I walk through it and I just think, okay, they picked an old kind of goldish frame for every for every painting that's just how they decided to do this but how do you typically think about reframing a masterpiece like this and what well, was the that's process a whole, that's a whole specialist thing because i mean for the virgin of the rocks the, the frame was made before the painting the painting was made to go in the frame and the frame was not a frame it was an altarpiece with by this family called the Mainos. And there are some examples of their work still in northern Italy. They did these huge, complicated machines with, well, I call them machines, but many levels combining sculpture in the round, sculpture relief, uh, panel paintings. They're unbelievably elaborate and fabulous things. And so um, this panel was the center of something that had at least three paintings in it. Um, and, um, you know, that relationship is gone now because we don't have all the other things we, it's not in a church it's not part of the enormous elaborate altarpiece about which the details of which are, are not um, completely understood or not agreed upon and so as is often the case in museums when you're talking about framing an old master painting um the context is so different so a religious altar is might have had what we call a tabernacle frame, which is fairly architectural, designed to sit on an altarpiece. If you want to be accurate and have a tabernacle frame, but then hang it on a wall next to another picture, it is missing its kind of bottom. Uh, we are compromises all the time. So frames now, I think when you're talking about framing an old master painting, we know a lot about there are enough surviving ex historic frames and unchanged frames, and but it's it's a tension between trying to frame a picture in something that would have been plausibly around it when it was made. But sometimes frames in, in museums are very important records of who's owned it subsequently. So, um, you know, if Joshua Reynolds owned a Renaissance painting and put a frame around it, as he, the same frame he put around all his paintings, then that Reynolds frame tells you something really interesting about what the 18th century believed about that picture. So maybe you want to keep that frame. Um, so there's a tension, I think, between all those things because the context is invariably very different. I want to pictures on a gallery wall. I mean, some, some great Baroque paintings were made for picture galleries, and so the context isn't that different, but many religious works were not designed to be lined up on a wall with 10 other ones. Um, so the lighting is different. Uh, viewing is different. So I think most old master galleries have that kind of interesting mix between frames that speak to the collecting history and then um, frames that are themselves historic. And if we reframe in a historic kind of frame, do we make a reproduction of a 16th century frame? Do we look for a 16th century frame? Yes to all those. <laughs> yeah. One of the neat and maybe selfish things about doing this show is that I learn things that I never would have encountered otherwise. And now, I mean, every time I go to a museum going forward, the something new is going to pop out at me every time I look at a painting that wouldn't have questions about framing. And that's not really something that's often mentioned on like the little placard. Uh, well, that's the thing. Paint. If anyone, do you think one thing 
from this podcast is that this idea that a picture on the wall of the Art Institute or the Met of the Louvre, you know, didn't get there handed down like a tablet to Moses. You know, it got there because it's been bought and sold and changed hands and people may have changed its shape and size and had different ideas about its quality and its framing, how frequently it was cleaned. It may have been hung opposite a window. It may not have been. You know, they all have a history that affects a countless chain of people deciding things about them, about what to do with it and how to present it from the minute it was painted till the way it's shown now. And all those things influence what you see. Um, you know, they're not, they're, they're decisions taken um, with varying degrees of um, sensitivity over the centuries that, that affect the way pictures look, how often they've been cleaned, what kind of ideas about retouching, how, what kind of varnish, how they're lit, how they're framed. Yeah, that's all going on around them. Hmm. Would you say that one of your goals in restoring a painting, or is the goal in restoring the painting, just so you mentioned that the, I think it was the the oil ages and it becomes darker, the oil-based paint. Is your goal in restoring a painting to make it appear essentially as if whatever this might mean, it's aged naturally over the past X, X years since it was painted, or do you want it to look as it was painted the day it was completed? Certainly, that that's, would be naive to think you could do that. I mean, there might be certain pictures that are miraculously well-preserved, and if you take off the varnish, then they look more or less as they were painted. But you have to work with what you have, and almost always with old master paintings, individual pigments. Regardless, let's just leave aside whether someone in in 1810 decided it'd be a good idea to cut off a third of it or, you know, do all that sort of thing. Let's just leave all that aside or that it was particularly badly cleaned and damaged or whatever. But nearly always the individual colors age differently within a picture. And so um, the greens may become brown. Uh, some colors may become transparent. Some may darken. Some may fade. And so... And then the further distortion of a yellow film across the whole thing takes it even further away. But let's say you remove this varnish beautifully, and then the picture is not going to show the same color relationships that it had. Um, and, you know, that that is a, a subject for discussion because many people feel like, oh, well, at least that yellow film gave a kind of unity that now isn't there because you might have... Uh, a very bright red that was balanced beautifully against a blue, which now looks black. Um, so there are different schools of thought about that. So anyway, I think the intent, in, as, as I see it, in, in cleaning and restoring old master pictures is to allow um, what's there to, to speak as close as, as best it can, you know, kind of unlock what's there and, and liberate it. Um, you can say liberate it from obscuring films on the surface. I would say uh, if you've got a lot of damages with poor retouchings or losses that careful, attentive, in many cases, not always, but that doing the restoration also allows the surviving paint to speak properly. Mm -hmm. I This wasn't a painting that I planned on discussing because there's only so many, but Rubens Het Steen, which I think you might have finished restoring a couple of years ago, if I'm correctly. Yeah. In cleaning the sky, you really got the colors to speak in a way much more close to what was intended, one might Yeah, suspect. that's a, well, that, that's quite... There, if you have an effect which is designed to show, you know, yellow highlights on the edges of clouds moving towards salmony pink sort of lit from below and the sun uh, actually in the picture painted yellow and then the you know this the blue sky and if you've got a yellow varnish over the whole thing then you know the yellow stays yellow but the blue goes very green and so that fundamental relationship is just obscured by the yellow varnish if that wasn't a question really about intensive retouching or damage just getting that yellow filter off unlock something but there that's a picture where it has a very kind of warm russet brown orangey foreground 
and then this you know really intense blue uh that kind of cool sky with some yellow highlights of course and um at different times in its history that contrast as created by rubens was thought to be a bit jarring and different parts of that picture were toned by restorers to make the whole thing look a bit golden uh the golden glow so that to me is an example where i'd say getting off the varnishes on a picture by rubens who was such a fabulous technician he suffers less than many many artists from kind of changes that put the picture out of key to itself so taking the varnish off just really allows that painting to sing and to sing for itself um but it is interesting that very intelligent and sensitive uh, lovers of Rubens at different centuries thought, yeah, but it really needs a bit of tone to make it harmonious. So it's useful to remember those things and to know about the history of how people look at pictures. Just to, it's humbling because, you know, what I'm quite confident about is core assumptions of the viewing experience, you know, just may not hold true in a century. Hmm. Well, let's uh, shift from. Leonardo to Caravaggio. Maybe you want to pronounce yeah, correct my yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Caravaggio. Yeah. Well, the the first painting that I had in mind was "Boy Bitten by a Lizard," which is a, is a fairly funny painting. But can you again? I mean, you did this wonderfully for Virgin of the Rocks. Give our our audio only listeners an idea of what's happening in the painting. Well, um, let me call it up so I just remember exactly what it looks like. Forgive the typing voices you're going to hear. Um, it's a, it's an illustration um, of a boy who's looking at a vase of flowers and probably not realizing that there was a lizard in the um, vase and it's it's nipped him on the finger. And so what this thing, I mean, it may have a kind of allegorical significance that's lost on me, but one of the things that, that's clearly what's going on is to try and demonstrate, it's a little bit art about art, I think. He's demonstrating a reaction, an effect, an, an effect and an emotional reaction, a facial expression, a movement. He's also showing you um, his ability to paint people, flesh, fabric, still life, flowers, you know, reflections, water, all that. It's a little bit, look what I can do. This is a guy trying to establish himself in his career. So all that's going on as well. So it is also meant to be not so serious, I think. You know, I may be wrong about that, but my view about that is it's also a little bit of fun to show, you know, it's almost like a visual joke, an like, owl. Um, but to capture that is is no small thing. Right, and I, my understanding is that I, I'm not a an artist, but that painting hands is one of the most difficult aspects of painting people. And there's a lot going on with these hands. So if this is meant to exhibit in some ways ability, this is a, a good way to do it. And of course, the lizard biting the hand, that this is the title of the painting, though I don't know if he gave it this title, maybe not. Yeah, possibly uh, not, no. It, yeah, it, it draws attention to the hands and the technique there. Hmm. I think the real intent was the reaction, the shock reaction, facial expression, which, you know, again, in an era before um, cameras, you know, holding a transient feature like that and convincing it re in a convincing realistic way is, is quite a demonstration. Right. And also, it would be quite difficult to ask a model to hold, I mean, a model couldn't really hold that, that facial expression. For one to paint yeah well that's one of the things with how much he used his own face and mirrors and things when he was starting in particular but yeah, the idea of models was complex and and the really interesting thing about him is the extent to which you know the thing that all his contemporaries wrote about was that he didn't do that elaborate renaissance idea of doing 15 drawings and working them up into a drawing you know he's kind of going for it on the canvas i mean drawing with the brush and then developing his ideas. Hmm. And I, I said that uh, maybe we would get back to layers, what's on top, what's on bottom when we got to 
Caravaggio, but you you wrote that in one of again one of the articles I read that this painting had a dark brown ground that was useful for him as he composed the other elements of the painting. And maybe we could say explicitly what the what the ground is and then how it's used. Or the ground how here is the affects- priming. It's the first color you put on the whole canvas, like the background underneath. You know, when you buy a canvas in an art store now, it's got a white ground, hasn't it? It's got a gesso, an acrylic gesso on it or whatever. So you'd say that's a white ground, like an impressionist picture. Well, in this period, he's using these grounds, which are actually... If you have the picture in front of you, um, the kind of mid-tone shadow of his chest or of his scarf, that is the ground. It doesn't have, has very little paint on it. So he's got that kind of, I mean, in, in England, you'd call it almost a biscuit color, but I mean a kind of, um, um, kind of you know, middle brown, kind of tawny brown color, um, sometimes darker, sometimes lighter. But there it is. It's built in already. Uh, as a mid-tone in terms of value, you know, between light and dark. And you don't have to do much, and particularly if you're painting flesh, to use that as your kind of shadow by... So you paint light colors on top to bring things forward, and then you glaze something transparent and dark over that kind of ground color to create a shadow. And you can leave it more or less exposed in those transitions in the middle. And uh, it's a very effective way because when you paint light colors over dark colors, they get very opaque very quickly. So you can cover very efficiently and it's a fast way to paint, faster than glazing light over dark over and over and over and over. Um, I mean, dark over light over and over and over, uh, like a white ground. So a darker ground allows you to, to, to do more work more quickly too. Hmm. And is it the the darker paints that you said were oil based i think it's all of it's oil based oil. yeah uh, but then so so then where does the egg come in just for the lighter colors oh with caravaggio well we have this idea that you know this we thought some years ago that he might have done that that really is not central to his painting technique at all but sometimes there's a belief that some of the fine fine white highlights on top of white like if you're doing threads of embroidery on a tablecloth, on a white tablecloth. It's all oil paint, but maybe just to get that little slightly raised, pure white, tiny highlights, he might have used different media. But he is painting an oil paint, you know, for the overwhelming majority of what he's doing. There's not much crazy experimentation going on. The revolutionary thing about him was that everyone remarked upon was, um, you know, painting from live models, not making drawings, and painting directly on the canvas. Mm. Well, I think that the the next painting that we'll get to uh, is one where these models really come to the fore. But before we move to that one, I'm guessing you've seen Tim's Vermeer. Tim's Vermeer? Yeah, the documentary. No, I don't think I have that. You- Somebody recreates a, a Vermeer painting, Tim, uh, incidentally. Okay, I think it was produced by Penn or Teller, one of them. But anyway, before I had seen this, I didn't realize, it just hadn't ever occurred to me that, oh yeah, artists once had to make their own paint. And you couldn't just go to a store and buy your paint. And it was a serious skill. I mean, you had to collect all sorts of things to make paint. But so it was... Caravaggio making all of these paints himself in his studio and to get the, the the precise sort of colors or qualities that he was hoping to get? Well, possibly, yeah. I mean, you know, that's the sort of thing also that you, that's what apprentices do. You know, if you look at, it's, it's, it's not that, I don't think Caravaggio would be grinding his, you know, his red color, but he certainly, somebody would have ground it for sure. Um, but, you know, there isn't this, it's the thing that makes the Caravaggio great is not some secret formula that he did with his red pigment that no one else did, or, you know, it's just the, the materials in Caravaggio are very standard across anybody painting in Rome in 1600. They're going to be a brown ground, and there's about five colors. You know, there's white, black, yellow, red, um, tiny bit of blue, but it's really expensive. You know, they're all using the same stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's true. Of course, a lot of the stuff had to be handmade. 
um, pigments ground. Um, they would have had preferences about what kind of paint they liked, but it wasn't so. That's not really where the where the revolution lies with him. It's about an attitude to um, painting from live models. Mm -hmm. Yes, my my question wasn't really about Caravaggio in particular, but just more a curiosity about how paint how paint was made. And source. Yeah, definitely. Well, there's, there's all sorts of recipes and understanding about how to grind your colors and what to do. And yeah, it, it had to be done in every studio. You start getting color men who will provide you prime canvases in the 17th century. But uh, yeah, typically it's the, the youngest apprentices who are going to be doing all that kind of donkey work of grinding. Um, you know, not much fun. But yeah. Well, the, the next painting of his that I wanted to talk about was the the Supper at Emmaus. Emma, yeah. <laughs> and I just, I pulled it up. Uh, and this is one, I mean, maybe you could describe it again, but this is one where I think models were, were used heavily. Yeah, but the interesting thing here also, yeah, we, we can even see some of the same people in different pictures by him. Um, but even there, it's pretty unlikely that he, got, you know, four people to sit around the table. He might have done, but he might have you know, made a collage of individually posed models. Um, but yeah, the whole immediacy, this is slightly unusual Caravaggio because he's painting it for, or to, for a, a very prestigious client. And so it's very high, it's unusually highly carefully finished for him. Um, but again, it's this interest in, in reaction and gesture and immediacy and you know this strong almost exaggerated well it is exaggerated perspective of the arm coming out at you or or um the figure in the lower left is actually meant to be you know pushing his chair back from the table like as if he's going to fall out of the canvas into your space remember these are effectively life-size figures too fair now why would this prestigious uh, or eminent client commission a painting of four people sitting at a table over a, a meal from Caravaggio. Why, why why would that be of interest rather than a port a, a portrait of the the client or some well, religious this is a scene? kind of history painting, which was seen as you know telling a narrative through the language of more than one figure, is the most lofty kind of painting because it's the most ambitious, difficult thing to do. This is not just four blokes sitting around the table. This is the moment in which they they realize who he is. And that's why they're looking astounded. Um, and it's possibly the innkeeper doesn't realize, but the apostles do. Uh, and so this is a huge uh, moment of drama realized through psychologically loaded uh, gestures and reactions, uh, all done with a naturalism that was astounding for its time, like the way that basket um, is sitting over the precariously over the front edge of the table again, like it might fall into your space. So you're having all these things going on that look incredibly naturalistic, and yet there's a huge amount of planning and um, consideration about um, reaction. But even they're also very carefully things. That, it takes a lot of thinking to make something look completely um, spontaneous. Look at those shapes of the shadow in the background. Or, you know, there are, there are lots of things that people write about, um, significance of some of these things. But, you know, in addition to the drama, it's, it's the idea that this biblical story is made tangible and real by doing it in the language, the visual language of people living at that time. You know, the kind of chair, what they're wearing, the tableware, all that is, is, um, uh, quite extraordinary in that it is everyday stuff. Although paradoxically, the decision to do this is a very kind of elite and learned decision. Hmm. Yeah, I had not, I, I embarrassingly hadn't realized that this was a biblical image. No, that's that Christ. Was... It's when the disciples realize he's the risen Christ and it's like, oh, they're, they're, they're reacting very strongly. It's not just some guys. Okay. And when you said this painting was very carefully finished is that with reference to two things like the shadows or uh, the ruffles in their clothing or the shell on the right general figure how far he took the you know 
painting wears threads on the seam or ha- individual hairs on beards. And he's normally a little bit broader in his execution. I mean, over like many artists, he gets looser as he as his career progresses. But this particular work is very highly finished for the specific specific circumstances of its commission. Hmm. And in the case of this painting in particular, how does or how did analyzing the paint show you the way in which the painting was set up or the order in which it was accomplished or even the way Caravaggio's thinking might have evolved as he painted it? Well, the fact that there's not much, um, let's say, for example, that the, the, the table, the white tablecloth is painted mostly around the elements on the still life, which tells you that he drew it. He drew that still life on the on the ground with the brown paint. You know, it's a, it was pretty carefully laid out because otherwise you might think, well, I'll paint the tablecloth and then paint the stuff on it. So, no, everywhere we look, we don't see overlaps of, you know, that Christ raised hand is, is not painted on top of the finished shoulder of the innkeeper standing behind him. You know, they're painted sort of worked up together after the, the brush drawing is put on the canvas. And the only real change we see is that the guy sitting on the right, his near leg used to be in front of the table and he decided to paint that carpet tablecloth over his leg, pushing him back. And that's interesting to think about because that's something you could imagine he did that because um, by pushing the rest of him back, it makes that hand stretching out into your space even more dramatic. And it also means that the guy on the left who's almost literally falling out of the picture is is out on his own in a plane where there's nothing else. So those kinds of things you, know, you can work out by looking at x-rays and say, well, this is a very, very carefully planned picture. And isn't it interesting that the one thing we see that's a kind of fundamental change that happened after he got well into the composition, you can see how it enhanced the drama. Hmm. Now, as I look at that hand that's stretching out toward me, I imagine it would be much easier to learn how to do this if you had maybe if you had a picture that you could look at rather than a model just because the picture already gives you a a two-dimensional representation of the perspective but how did would somebody like Caravaggio have have learned how to paint with this perspective was he already just like a very skilled draftsman and would spend or had spent a lot of time just drawing images like this to get it correct before he started painting like this? Well, it depends what you mean by drawing. I mean, that is the great critical question about Caravaggio. There's a very famous article in the history of art history saying, did Caravaggio draw? Because, you know, there aren't drawings. There aren't bits of, you know, someone like uh, Anibale Caracci, his great uh, contemporary and um, you might say rival, but that's not right. Anyway, um, he was uh, someone of whom there are hundreds of, beautiful drawings, figure studies, arm studies, uh, compositional studies have come down to us. There are none from Caravaggio. And that was part of the polemic is that he didn't believe in all that preparatory work, but clearly he knew how to draw. And he drew with the brush. He must have had a very rigorous training. But it, the idea of preparatory separate studies uh, put together to work up a composition in the kind of classical way is just not something that he did. It's funny that I accidentally stumbled upon one of the <laughs> most important uh, art historical questions about um, Caravaggio. But yeah, well, you know, he just he, that, that's we... part of the polemic that you know a lot of people. What's good about him is what's bad about him. People think, oh, it's so naturalistic, and other people of his contemporaries would say, oh, it's so you know, it's 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 almost vulgar. It's 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 rough. It's not properly abstract and idealized. Uh, and weirdly, it's that kind of idea that the naturalism is actually the kind of elite progressive idea, <laughs> at least amongst his circle of patrons in Rome. So it's not as much of a, a reverie as the first painting we looked at, the Virgin of the Rocks. Certainly not. But the great, the great comparator for him, as I say, is Anibale Caracci, who's more like a Baroque uh, Raphael, where there's an idea and abs- abstract idea about 
um, you know, beauty being important in a picture and beauty being idealizing figures and thinking about color relationships almost independently, you know, making beautiful balanced colors across the composition and uh, a kind of distillation into an idealized world, um, which is not what Caravaggio was interested in showing you. Dude, Caravaggio, I don't know if this is the right, is the actual title of the painting, um, the card sharps, or did he paint that? Yeah, he painted a couple of versions of that. Okay, it's interesting. I mean, they're very similar. It's a very similar painting to this in terms of the composition or the angle, the the ground. I mean, it's just something that's coming to yeah, mind. Yeah, half length figures around the table, action drama for sure. You know, just yeah. not as lofty a subject. Right. Well, shall we turn to the the third of the paintings of Caravaggio? I wanted to talk about. Is it Salome or Salome? with the head of John the Baptist. Well, however you like. I would say Salome, but that's maybe that's English way of saying it, Salome. Yeah. This is a late picture, possibly one of the last things he painted. And already you can see in this work that um, in keeping with what happened to him is that his palette became uh, very restricted. The grounds are a bit darker than not many colors. The drama is emphatic and the finish is loose. Um, but even that, you know, again, we can't, we got to resist trying to um, over egg the modernity of that because he also did some things that made it look, uh, you know, quite carefully did some things th to make it look more spontaneous than it is, too. So, but this is him paring down, you know, all the constituent elements of his painting to something that, um, is very powerful because it's very expressive because it is just that it's it's it feels like nothing can be added that would not make it worse mm. well something conservation related to this question in particular is i understand that there were a number of incisions on it when you looked at it so where would these incisions have come from and how well, that, that's, are this again is one of those things where the conservator can help enter the discussion because if the pre if the key critical thing about Caravaggio is if he painted using live models, you know, how did he do that? And one of the things that people have worked out is that while the ground, the priming layers are still fairly um soft and malleable, he might actually scratch some crude kind of place markers in the canvas to help him really to help him repose models on the same pose. So he's kind of drawing with the stick in, in the canvas, but not drawing in a way that, um, as you would understand that you're making a form, but he might do a little squiggle where the elbow was. So like when the model came back, it was like, you would know the elbow there. So that the pattern of, of, um, incisions is often just a little contour where the elbow is, where an ear was. So we get the tilt of the head exactly right, just so you could resume the pose. So he seems to have made people used incisions in paintings, generally with rulers to help lay out Renaissance perspectives. Or, But he's doing it in a dynamic way, which is all in the service of the things people were writing about him during his lifetime, which is this, you know, painting from life. So as a conservator trying to unpick what's going on, you know, not me, but many people before me looking at those things, looking at X radiographs and seeing what are these scratches and what function did they serve? It all starts to coalesce. And again, that's the, the joy of our work is that it happens because of us um, interacting with, um, speaking, reading, understanding that the art historical discussions around what he's about. So there seems to be a way he evolved to kind of put markers, little daubs of white paint to suggest where the hinge of a hip might be, some scratches around, you know, an elbow or an ear or a shoulder, just to help that model come back and get the same lean and get it exactly how we want it. Um, so that's going on in this picture. It's nothing like a comprehensive drawing at all. Some of them have almost nothing. You know, maybe one knee is scratched in the canvas, like, a, and others have got a lot of incisions. One of the most interesting things to me when I was reading 
one of your article on this painting was that he would draw the ears first in this same well, this is one theory as well that a guy called Tommaso Schneider came up with. And not even drawing them, but he would just put some two red strokes again so you know how the head would go. Not like this, but like this. Um, just to place the head. So again, it's there's a little system of putting the ears placers in the right place, doing some contours and a bit of white highlights here and there to help resume the pose and then start painting. Mm. But... With regard to St. John the Baptist head first, I mean, he drew the, he, I think he had the ear more or less, and correct me if I'm wrong, more or less completely painted. And then he put the hair, he painted the hair over it. And I this is something that you could. painted, but he had it suggested. He had that red stroke, like this is where it is. Yeah, definitely. Right. And this this helps ensure that everything's going to be symmetrical. But it's interesting that it's like Well, not even symmetrical, the, just that he knows the relationship of that head and where it sits with the other heads, and they're all placed in the right relationship, and it's consistent in different sessions of posing. I mean, that's the theory. No one, no one can ask him, but that's kind of the, our working knowledge of how those things work. They're just in the service of him painting from life, which is the – that's the headline, is um, – even if you had to get four different people holding poses at four different times, but the idea that each one is observed, the way the light falls, the drapery, all those things, is right. based on life observations painted directly on the canvas. So you, that aside, you don't see it as also in the spirit of ensuring that the head really looks like a head by getting the ears in there first, even if he paints over them and ensures that there's... okay. No, I don't think that. I mean, I think you know, he, he makes things look the way he wants them to look everywhere. But I think these these little strokes around the ear and the incisions are m most people understand them as placement. And those red strokes generally are covered with more subtle, um, sophisticated and accurate uh, modeling and color renderings. They're nearly always underneath something you see. Were there any other particular features of this painting that required special care in conserving it. I imagine that the serious contrast between the light and the dark colors might raise a special consideration. Well, I mean, that, that, these kind of pictures pose all sorts of problems for photographers photographing them. They're very, very hard to photograph, but uh, no, in terms of, I mean, the issue is that I think, um, some of that thick, bright colored paint, you know, is, maintains a hue and intensity that some of the darker tones, the differences between them are harder. They're more vulnerable to historic damage. So they required a bit more retouching in some areas than others. But um, no, not really. I mean, from that point of view, it's very technically, it's not complex what it's doing. It's, it's the concept that is. Mm. And just a, 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 a a question about what we're supposed to see. Are these maybe like smudges on the executioner's hands, these sort of reddish browns? Are those meant to indicate blood from the execution? Just a second, I'm gonna call it up and make sure we're on the side of the right run. Um, on his hands. So like around the thumbnail, for instance, or the, the hand that's the knuckles of the hand that's holding the sword. Or are those just shadows? They're just shadows. But that, I mean, the interesting thing there is that those shadows are in this kind of, you know, chocolate brown um, color. Uh, and they're meant to look like he's left the ground showing through. But in fact, he's added them at the end to make the picture, in my view, I mean, not everyone agrees with that, but I think he's doing things deliberately at the end to make it look more spontaneous. He's carefully considering how to make it look um, spontaneous in certain areas because the rhetoric around finish and painting from the life was such that, that the look of something that was done fairly effortlessly leaving the ground exposed was something that interested him. 
Yeah. Well, now I think we can move to authorship, I guess. And and the question, uh, well, the, the painting in particular is Rubens, drunken Salinas supported by satyrs. Mm. So when and where did Rubens paint? Well, um, he is the painter from Antwerp who painted most of his life in Antwerp, but his story is the one that a um, very learned man was a young man. He went to Italy and something happened there in Italy that just exploded and turned him into one of the greatest, you know, figurative painters of all time. And I think his, his experience in Italy was fundamental um, to how he painted. He was a very intelligent man. He looked hard at everything. He drew, he copied, he painted you know, tirelessly. And then he came back to Antwerp um, from memory um, around 169 and established himself there as, um, you know, one of Europe's leading artists until he died in 1640. So, um, yeah. So what's your question now about this picture? I'm sorry, I lost it. But... <laughs> Well, we'll we'll get to. I mean, I think my understanding is the the main debate here is about authorship and what his studio was like, how it was set up. Yeah, but first, this is something that's disconcerting to a lot of people. But then you just think of you know, this is one where we have all kinds of models. And you think about. I remember as a kid when reading in the news that you know people were debating whether when Salvador Dali died, that oh he didn't paint this, his, his workshop painted that, and I was horrified and scandalized as a kid. Or we think about the Warhol factory and what a Warhol is. Well, it's not a million miles away, but the Rothschild studio was the same. But in Rubens, I think there was a tradition in, in Flanders about scaling up and having a corporate enterprise. But Renaissance painters did this too. But Rubens is a, a maybe a more in-your-face example because of the scale of what he did and the kind of permissions. But um, he like many artists, but he had it systematized to a certain extent, would have a very kind of, um, depending on what you paid and what discussion you had with him and the scale of a work, you might get something entirely by him or something that was designed and invented by him and blocked in by his students, or it's not his students, his, his workshop, and then maybe retouched at the end by him. And then things that were his invention maybe a small oil sketch then made entirely by the workshop that he never touched. He writes about that very explicitly to somebody called Dudley Carlton in the 1620s, where he explains how this works and, you know, kind of what the price plans are for the different things. And, you know, you, you can have what you like. This is how I roll. Um, all me, my idea, my retouching, or my idea completely executed by the studio. And so many pictures... You know, he had specialist people painting fruit and vegetables and still life elements. He had animal painters. He had, uh, um, and he could do all this stuff, but he, he definitely, it was a kind of corporate enterprise. And it was understood as such. I think a lot of these pictures, you know, we worry now about whether a particular painter painted every leaf or everything, but it would have been understood as, you know, like the brand, you bought a Rubens. I mean, he may have bought a great Rubens, but he bought Rubens, but he bought Rubens. And um, um, so that that's kind of where this picture sits and you know, how how might it, can you unpick who who did what? I mean, the, his most famous and most gifted pupil who entered as a teenager was Anthony Van Dyck, who left as a young man too. But he was already doing quite important commissions for the Rubens studio that he was essentially executing himself. And that's one of the discussions around this picture is the extent to which um, it's kind of essentially painted by Van Dyck. That's a one view. Not everybody holds that view. Or maybe you can't really unpick it. It just should be seen as a Rubens with a lot of studio participation. But the interesting thing is just how that worked, that dynamic. Before we get into some of the specifics that might help us untangle the question of authorship here, what was the what was the commission uh, for this painting? Who who bought it? Why was it I don't produced? Know. I don't actually know. 
I don't even know if it is now. But in, I'm not sure. But obviously, it would have been that he painted that subject a lot. There's a really great one in Munich, and I think there's one possibly in St. Petersburg. Um, very different looking pictures, one from another. Um, mm. it, Can you had, it may have some resonance with Stoic philosophy and the idea of a guy out of control and you know what that means about control being um, something that's very important. But it might be you know, lighthearted examination of what happens if you... If you let your stoicism slip, I don't really know exactly what, you know, why you'd want to have this subject, but it is one you definitely return to several times. Can you explain the the scene again for our our audio listeners? Well, it's uh, show me the way to go home. The the, mor- the morning is um, dawn is broken. It's morning. Silenus, who is you know one of Bacchus's um, playmates. Um, is basically staggering home, carrying a bundle of grapes. He's being supported by satyrs. There are nymph, uh, Minad behind, squeezing grapes over his face. There's music, there's a, a pan pipes being played. Um, it's revelry, uh, ending in the morning, and he's in no fit state even to walk. Hmm. And you, you mentioned there were, uh, people who might specialize in, in painting fruit, and there are people who would specialize in animals or, or landscapes. But if this is happening in his studio, let's say, uh, do you happen to know if somebody else painted the, well, maybe nobody knows, but do you happen to suspect whether somebody else painted those fruit, for instance? Well, I mean, he definitely had people who painted those things, that, but that that's not the top, top quality um, you can look at it and see it's a different hand. And even the way the, the stalk stop and start around the hands. Um, I don't know if we know, we'd be confident who painted this particular one, but there are all sorts of artists who we know collaborated with him on animals and fruit and such. Um, this, the, these grapes are a little bit mechanical. Sorry. Uh, and, and would that suggest that you did not paint them? Oh, definitely. I, I would say so. And maybe, but also it suggests that maybe not the top kind of still life painters that he worked with would have painted it either. I don't know. You know, that's one for specialists to worry about. Hmm. So does this, does that question just of the grapes not really require the sort of analysis that goes into preparing to conserve or restore a painting? Well, from a conservation point of view, it's all the same paint. You know, it's the same material, the same pigment, the same oil. No, that's just, it's a very interesting critical issue. And to me, in that case, it's just, it, there's evidence all over this picture of a kind of corporate enterprise at work. And and that, to me, is the interesting thing, rather than necessarily trying to unpick who did what bit, if you can, but you may not ever know precisely. Although, you know, some of the major kind of, but then this is totally subjective. This is not conservation at all, but the kind of looking at the style of how some of the things are drawn, they look, to my eye, very much like Van Dyck painting in the Rubens workshop in that period. But some people think that and other people don't. So that, that's neither here nor there. But I mean, that the issues with many Rubens, the extent to which they're painted, or how much Rubens paint is on them, which is one of the thrilling things about Head Stain. That's made late in his life by him for his house. Every decision you see, everything you see about when something's finished, when it's loose, um, it's it's as he wanted it, rather than as someone interpreted his wishes. Hmm. Well, what then are the particular issues about this painting that aging posed or damage posed? for the conservator? Well, one of the interesting things here is that um, we know that he used a translucent brown glazing color to make some shadows in flesh painting that have faded and gone very chalky. So if you're able to look at this ever online and zoom in around, say, the eye sockets of the old woman carrying the torch at the right, you'll see a kind of weird inversion within the flesh modeling of where you expect tones to get darker, they they get a bit lighter. 
in a lot of the flesh painting, and that's because that 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 transparent pigment has gone chalky and faded. Um, and that's an interesting conservation issue because we think about you know we know that's the case, so you say, well, why don't you just paint them dark? Because we don't know exactly what color or how dark, and it's but it's a good question to ask. Um, everyone has a different idea of when re too much retouching occurs, you know, and I think in the early, early 21st century, the consensus is that you wouldn't do that. It's just not the right thing to do. It's too interventive. Um, that may not be the case 50 years from now, or they may think the retouchings we do are too interventive. That's a whole discussion. When I zoom in, to the, the highest res version to look at this old woman's face. I see these sort of very small, but like bluish streaks all across the painting, particularly the, the I mean, they stand out most on the dark ground behind them, but what causes that? I'm not sure I know what you mean. Let me see if I can. These little white specks, you mean? The, that's just reflections of the texture. That's that's a, that's an artifact of the photography because the you know the canvas is not flat. It's got loads of dips and cracks, and I think you're picking up little tiny highlights from the varnish film. That's not a feature of the painting at all. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. How, I mean, this is, this is a, I guess, a, a, a much broader question, but how does the conservation of a painting like this, looking at all of that imaging, so you see the layers, seeing the, that geological stratification of the paint, how does that affect your appreciation for an artwork like this? Well, I think, you know, the, the more you know about the painting, the richer your understanding. Um, I think understanding how materials are used and the skill and economy with which they're used. Um, it's not essential to having a beautiful experience looking at a picture, but it, it adds a, another layer of resonance to the visual experience. So um, from that point of view, you know, a lot of museums like the National Gallery were founded um, with an intention that they were a kind of school for painting. And they were meant to play a vital role in the education of artists um, in, in the National Gallery, certainly in the early 19th century. Um, so I think the idea of looking at something and thinking about how it was painted is kind of baked into the museum experience. It was in the 19th century. Now we think less about that, probably more about stories and meaning and all emotions but um i think um you know we're privileged as conservatives working on these pictures to to really spend time with them over many months looking very closely learning a great deal about how they're made and what they're made of and that kind of forms a background to them thinking about what artistic intent is and how it's achieved mm -hmm. Well, the, the last thing that I, I wanted to ask as we talked today, I mean, these projects, they take a lot, many, many years of research before you start conserving them. And the, the conservation effort itself takes many years. But what does a, a typical day's work look like as the keeper of the National yeah, Gallery? But I would say that, you know, they, they vary a lot because we're doing lots of things and we work in a public sector institution. The conservation department in a modern museum spends a lot of time preparing paintings for loan and thinking about how they need to be glazed and unglazed and worrying about light levels and um, being involved in meetings about the design for this and that, you know, all the stuff that everyone does in the workplace. So I wish I could say that, you know, we spend 40 hours a week at the easel, but that's not what the job is. So treatments can take months and sometimes years. Um, so I think, you know, typical day in the workplace is a mixture of all that stuff. I think like all of us, you know, we have meetings that are, um, necessary, if not inspiring and meetings that are less necessary. Um, and then, um, 
time working. And But generally, I would say that in, in most museum conservation departments, conservators will have at least two things on the go because the nature of the process, you might wait for imaging or you might want to have a break from doing a particularly laborious retouching to do something completely different. So um, I think there's a lot of variation in what we do, but uh, with, with any luck, you get a good couple of hours of sat sitting down concentrated you know, work at the easel. Well, Larry, this has been such a, a pleasure and an awesome conversation on, on my end because, I mean, this is an area on like uh, philosophy where, where I, I tend to know more going in. I, I've just learned so much from talking to you and, and reading your reading about your work. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. It's been my pleasure. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Earhart.